Hello, my name is Matt Rabel and today I'm going to show you how to build a mobile application with React Native and Spring Boot. This screencast is based off a tutorial that I wrote and published back in October of 2018, but I've also kept it up to date, so it's using the latest and greatest version of React Native and JHipster. The source code for this project is available on GitHub and in this project you'll see there's a demo.adoc. This file you'll see right here is a script that basically shows how to create this tutorial with the minimal steps needed. The project that I'm going to create is based on 21 points. 21 points health is an app that I wrote as part of the jhipster book 5.0 that allows you to basically track your health. And so it has a user, it has points, weight, and blood pressure. And how it works is you'll basically enter in points for each day. You get a point if you exercise, you get a point if you eat well, you get a point if you didn't drink any alcohol or maybe you just had one glass of wine. And then you can also add your weight or your blood pressure. So this is an app that I use and you can see it here at 21points.com where I can add in points for a specific day. Or I could add in my blood pressure or I could add in my weight and so that's how the whole thing works so what I've done is I've exported the JDL for this into the sample JDL project JDL samples and so JDL is jhipster domain language and what this allows you to do is define an application that has various things like OAuth 2, Postgres, Gradle, Elasticsearch. So if you want to know more about that, this just kind of a jhipster thing, not so much a Spring Boot thing, but we can copy the the code from this and go back to our tutorial and we'll start. First of all, you have to make sure you have jhipster installed. So I already do. And I can do jhipster version and you can see I'm using 5.8.0. I can create a directory to hold my application and we're going to have an API and an app so I'm going to call the API jhipster API so we'll do react native spring boot jhipster API oh I forgot the dash p and then I'll cd into there and vi this app jh and put that jdl in there and then I'll go into the jhipster API directory and this is how jhipster works when you're creating monoliths is you want to actually be in a new empty directory and create your application from there so you can just type jhipster and it'll prompt you with a number of questions but since I've already defined them in my JDL I can do import JDL and point to that file so that's created a whole bunch of code for me and generated the entities and their screens and tests that they need so I would like to see what the code coverage looks like so I'm going to start by running this sonar cube command, but before I do that, I'm going to start all the Docker containers that we're going to need. And those are all included with jhipster. And now I can run clean test and send all the results to sonar. Then we can open that up at localhost 9001 click on the project to be analyzed you'll see health points has AAA rating and 70% or 71% code coverage so not bad eh back to our steps uh, the next step is to add a react native application so I already have Ignite CLI installed, so if I run Ignite version, you can see 2.2.2 is installed, so I can do Ignite new health points. And the reason I'm calling it health points is that's what I want the name to be in the application itself. I will actually rename that directory after this is created. So we'll specify the path to our jhipster project directory, which is jhipster API. And then it finds a config file and asks me if I want to enable end-to-end -end tests. I'll just accept the default. And then one thing you should know is that this does create a git directory. Um, 
And so if you're trying to save both projects, uh, it's actually better to just delete this one. And then I'm going to rename the directory health points to React Native App. And then we'll go ahead and add it. Or we'll do a git init on this parent directory. And then make sure we have everything. Oh, that's because we have one in this one as well. Okay. So now we're at a stage where we have all of those files added. And we can say add React Native app. And this does create a couple files on the server side that allows basically a client like a React Native app to talk to jhipster. And so what it does is it sets up a resource server on the Spring Boot API, and that allows us to talk to the back end with just a jot. Just to show you that the back end does work, um, first thing I want to do is restart uh, Docker because it made some adjustments to the basic Docker configuration to allow implicit flow with, uh, with OAuth. And that will allow the client to talk to it. And then I'll go ahead and start the server. CD into jhipster API, start with Gradle W. And while that's going, I'm also going to go into the React Native client and run pod install in the iOS directory. And then we can run react native run iOS. So you can see that can take some time the first time around, 3 minutes 37 seconds. Um, what I would like to show you is that you can go to this local host, you can sign in to the Spring Boot API that's generated by jhipster and it'll log into Keycloak and everything works and then you can see your entities so if we were going to go to points we could create a new point and say hey today January 28th I exercised I ate well and it's a happy Monday and then we could assign that to like the admin user so you can see it saves everything in there and this is a react UI that's what I chose when I created it and then if we go back to our simulator you can see our app is here as well and it'll prompt us to go to I believe this is because we have local host specified when we switch to Oct it'll actually say the domain name there and then you can put in admin admin and we're logged in now and you can go to entities and we haven't generated any entities for this client so let's do that in this project we can do uh, let me get the command here it's generate import JDL um, I do want to let you know that if you want to run on Android you can you just have to use react native run Android you have to have Android studio running and you have to have an AVD running and then you have to do some mappings of ports. Um, that's why I'm using iOS, it's just a little simpler for this specific example. So I'm going to import those same entities and you'll notice it actually generated not only the entities themselves but also tests. So that's pretty slick and I can go back to my simulator and hit Command R. and all those entities should be there now. And if I click on point, you'll see the one I entered on the client is actually there. So back to our tutorial. The next step is I want to make it so, um, well, so it doesn't do that. Um, but basically I'm going to change the form model. So instead of having just text fields, you can see it back here, um, we'll have actually like checkboxes. So right now they're just text fields. I want to change those to like iOS toggles. So if I go back to the tutorial here, the first thing I'm going to do is I need to modify uh, the points entity edit screen and change the four models from exercise, meals, and alcohol from them being strings to being booleans. 
And just by changing that, the underlying form generator that this React Native project uses will know that those should be toggles instead of input fields. So if we search for points entity edit screen, you'll see here's where everything is at. So I can change from T number to T boolean. And then there's a few other changes you need to make in order to convert from a number basically to a boolean. So down in change entity to form value. So this is when it comes from the entity, when it comes from the API, and it's going to present it on the UI. We're going to want to look and say, hey, if that value is equal to 1, then go ahead and, you know, set it to true. And then same thing when you're converting from the form back to the entity, do the same thing. If it's uh, true or false, convert it to 1 or 0 just because that's what I want to store in the database because the 1s and the zeros allow me to add up how many points they got in a week rather than just going through true and false. So there we are. And then the last thing I want to do is actually go up into the default settings, the default form, and change the value from not just having a default ID of null, but to having default values that make sense. A null ID, the current date, true for exercise meals now called, meaning that, hey, I expect you have a good day by default, and only check the ones that, you know, you didn't succeed at. And now we should be able to refresh our app. We can go look at our entities. And if we edit it, you'll see that now they're toggled. So if we toggle this one and says, I didn't exercise today, saved it, and then went back to localhost 8080, and went to the points entity, you can see that it changed it. So it's changing it on both sides. All that's working. Um, the only thing is, this one's not quite the same, right? If we went and looked at this, or we edited it, it's not quite the same. So let's let's make that similar as well. So first of all, I'm going to start yarn because that will allow me with jhipster to basically uh, just refresh the UI automatically without me having to go in. And, uh, and you know, start and stop the server. And then I'm going to open up the project in IntelliJ. And then we'll find points update. And you'll see here's the HTML or the JSX or TSX for it. Um, so we have exercise label. We have points, meals, alcohol. So we can take all those and replace them. with ones that basically say true value is one, false value is zero, and it's a type checkbox. So if you're wondering how I created all that code really quickly, you'll see here I have this short code called React Checkboxes. That's something I pre-recorded. I used IntelliJ's live templates feature. If you would like to use them, you can find all of my live templates at this URL, github.com slash mrable, idea live templates, and you can import them into your IntelliJ instance. And so now if I go here, go to my points, and create a new one, you'll see we have checkboxes as well. So we could say, hey, for Sunday, I wasn't quite as good, but it snowed a lot. And that's why I didn't go outside. And then you can see it converted everything successfully. So the last thing, or one of the last things I want to do is show you how you can configure this for Okta instead of Keycloak. So in the jhipster API, if I look in application YML, it's got a number of settings for its OAuth and OIDC configuration. So this basically talks to Spring Security and its OAuth support. 
and gives some URIs as well as a client ID, a client secret. And this allows it to talk to Keycloak and make everything work. So really the only thing we need to do is override these properties to point to a different OAuth or OIDC provider. So with Okta, you can start by creating a new application. So if you don't have an account, you can go to developer.okta.com. Go ahead and click sign up and create one. I already have one and I have my password stored in one password. So I can sign in. I can create a new application. So this will work for any J Hipster app. I'm going to click on web. I'm going to say my Spring Boot API. And then for the login redirect URI, you're going to want to use localhost8080 login locally. And when you deploy to production, obviously, you're going to have to add one of those for production as well. And then we'll go ahead and say refresh token. And there's a new feature in jhipster 5.8 that I just added that allows you to do global OIDC logout. And so to make that feature work, you actually have to go in and add a logout redirect URI of just the domain where you're hitting, not the slash login. And now we have a client ID and a client secret. So what I recommend you do is create a octa.env file. So I actually already have one. I call it .octa.env. And you can see here it overrides all those properties for Spring Security. And we're just going to edit these two. So I can go ahead and copy this one. And edit that one. Then client secret as well. And this is generally a good idea because you're not storing your client ID or your client secret in GitHub when you check your project in. You'll just have the regular Keycloak settings in there. And so now what you can do is you can stop this process, source your octa.env and restart it. And now this jhipster app will be talking to Okta for authentication. And you can see since I'm already logged in, it automatically logged me in. And like I said, there's a new feature in 5.8.0 that actually logs you out. So if you try to sign in again, it'll prompt you. And you could log in, for instance, with a different user. There we are. And so the next step is to configure the native application. So we're going to use this login redirect URI. And what happens is when you create the React Native application, it, it generates this for you, whatever your app name is. And so on Okta, see if I'm still logged in. Nope. So I've got to log out because I'm logged in as that demo user. And then I'll log in with my admin account. And I can create a new native application. And we'll just say React Native and login redirect URI is this. And we'll say refresh token as well. And so then it gets a client ID. So you want to put that into, I have the path name here. It's React Native App Modules Login Login.sagas.js. search for that and it's right here basically in the configuration put that in there and you can remove this client ID that's no longer used and this normally gets this information from the endpoint in the API so if you look at API auth info you can see it has the issuer in there and actually has a client ID so um, but this is a client ID for the Spring Boot API, right? This is not for the native app. So that's why I overrode it. Okay, and now we can restart. Or we can log out of this one. So we'll go ahead and hit log out. And then refresh. And then log back in. Now you see it's going to Okta. 
we can go ahead and put our credentials in and you can see your entities now the reason you'll be able to see the points entities in this case is because we haven't done anything to filter on the admin person so if you want to see how to do that um, check out my 21 points application it has many security features in there that prevent users from seeing each other's data as well as editing editing each other's data um, the other thing I wanted to show you is Reactotron so Reactotron is great for debugging React native applications so you can see here if I go and I refresh my app it actually shows up here in Reactotron so you can see that it made a request in the beginning to get my account and you can see that it actually came back with a 200 and you can see the response so um, that's all pretty neat and uh, you know it allows you to actually put in like console.tron.log instead of console.log and get debug messages in there so I found it very useful in my use of react native if you want to package this app for production I'm not going to go into it here today because it's already kind of long um, but this shows you how to package your Spring Boot app and send it to Cloud Foundry and then what you need to do on the client to make that work and also I included instructions for deploying it to Google Cloud Platform using Kubernetes and then of course the clients you just have to update to point to that URL so um, that should all be all you need in there if you uh, if you have any questions please leave a comment on this post so you can find the source code again on github uh, if you want to learn more about jhipster go to jhipster.tech um, the ignite jhipster project which i used to create this is from john rudell and you can find it on github as well my name is matt rabel follow me on twitter at mrabel follow my team at octadev if you like this screencast and want to see more when they're produced or when they're published Friends don't let friends write authentication, so go to developer.octa.com and subscribe to our YouTube channel because we have lots of good stuff here in screencasts like this one.